with. All right, today we're going to start with the animal behavior or exam. We're going to um, start with the four questions of Niklaus or Nicholas Tinbergen. Um, and this is your basics of what and how you look at animal behavior. So there's four questions that must be asked the causation, the developmental, the function, and the uh, phylogeny. All right, so the causation is the how, the hormones, the brains, the muscle control. It's uh, what makes it in the um, anatomy to be that way. How come, you know, we know birds migrate south for the winter, but how do they migrate south for the winter? And, um, you know, there's abilities in the brain to register magne um, magnetic fields in there. So that'd be the how. The, um, the melamental would be, how does this um, behavior develop? It, develop? Um, so as in, you know, an, another way to use, um, we'll use this later on in the PowerPoints, but like how does this develop it? It'd be um, how come the mongoose can get the cobra? How did he realize that uh, they can eat snakes and stuff like that? And it's because they can um, have a certain protein that bounces off venoms. The, the function is how does the behavior give an advantage? We can use um, birds in their, you know, their ability um, to pluck, um, rough their feathers to attract mates. Um, the more feathers, the brighter the colors, the more they um, get the mate and the history of this behavior. And that's how you see how it came to be from the first birds of this and, you know, the evolution of how everything went. So I'm going to, on this slide, um, talk about proximate versus ultimate. So proximate is, you know, the how things work, not the why, but how. So we're gonna use mongooses. Again, it's like, how are mongooses able to withstand cobra venom? We know they eat cobras, but how are they? And the why question is like, why does a wolf in a pack look under the chin of an alpha when they're approaching? Um, if you notice any sign that it's a missive dog or some missive wolves meet an alpha, it will actually put their head down the ears go back and they will lick the underneath the chin of the dog. And that is the why questions. And so that's how you look at um, proximate versus ultimate when you're studying behavior. You're like, okay, he's doing this, but how's he doing this? Um, and then he's doing this and we know how, but why is he doing this? And so that's the proximate versus the ultimate. Another way to look at proximate versus ultimate is this example right here. Um, so I used the banded mongoose, okay? So proximate questions is how do they deal with snake bites? They have a certain acetylcholine, acetylcholine, yes. Um, it's a certain protein that actually, they are not immune to venom, but they have the ability in their cellular level to the venom will bounce off of it because you know venom you can drink and it's fine, but it has to be injected into the blood system to um, actually cause what it's doing, whether it's a neuro or hemotoxin. Um, so they have the ability to stop that. And that is the how is proximate. Um, how do they know uh, who is in their pack and warn others? So band of mongoos all kind of look the same and tons of times their colony will meet with other colonies. Well, so the how they do that is every morning they will actually groom each other. And when they're grooming, they release a sink gland and the sink gland will establish each individual pack member. Um, the ultimate question is like, why do they move across the savanna in Africa as a big, big pack? You'll notice that they have the leader in the front, but everybody else is that. And the why is honestly for that one is they want to, um, behaviorists are thinking they want to look bigger from a distance. And one little mongoose looks like he's a prey, but if you're from a distance and try to figure out, it looks like a huge actual predatorial animal moving across the, um, the uh, savanna. And, um, why do young males arrive first at the burrows? Well, they are your sentries. They arrive first out to see if there's predators around. And if there's no predator around, they will let the elder and the alphas and the, the dominants and the, the children know. And um, that's how they, it, it's a young man's game per se. They have to be the first out to see if there's predators or they can run. Um, proximate uses a lot of hormones, however. Um, and there's two different types, the organizational, organizational, what is the permanent effect of hormones on the structure and the function of the body? 
an activation effect, um, which is, is triggered. So I used deer for this example, uh, white-tailed deer. So organizational way to look at it is the white-tailed deer males have antlers um, and their antlers are not just triggered growth due to hormones of a certain time per se. They are, testosterone goes through their body when they're born. Um, it comes to the pituitary gland and it's a releasing hormone. Even castrated um, bucks have hormones and what they do, they, they will um, they will start forming um, antlers and they would have velvet on them. And they will be in normal shape, but they remain covered in velvet and um, very susceptible trauma because of testosterone. But the organizational part of that is they were born with testosterone. That is a hormone in their body that created the growth of antlers in the first place. Now the activational part is in internal regulators as in for seasonal patterns. Um, the season and the patterns, they very much will trigger the amount of growth. So let's say you have the antlers that cover them in velvet and they're doing fine, they're normal testosterone. Those who are not, test, not castrated, after they reach a certain age and a certain um, season comes around, um, mating season, spring, seasonal patterns, they will lose the velvet, they will start growing calcified antlers and then they can start mating. And so that's the actual trigger. That testosterone is triggered by a certain time, this certain mating period. Um, another way to look at it is you know, a triggered hormone scent. If you're going ever going hunting, you can put uh, doe urine and whether it's mating season or not, they can smell it and the bucks will actually say that doe's in heat and they will ignore all other senses because you have triggered an activational effect of hormones to make him just, I'm going to mate this, whatever it is in him. Watching the behavior is another thing. Um, so we know the hows, we just did the hormones, proximate versus ultimate, now we're gonna watch it. And there's certain ways to watch it. You have the um, cross-sectional study and the longitudinal study. Now, a cross-sectional study is a snapshot of a population during a certain time, measuring the group during a specific time. And uh, the cons to that is your independent factors to lose variability. Um, I, for my observation study we did in the class, I used actual, um, I have a buck that shows up at the end of the wood line uh, that has seven deer that only show up. And, and one of them is a buck and the rest are does. And the buck is the last one to show up out the wood lines and he's the last one to eat and the first one to get back in the woods. So I was seeing how far I could pull the trough I feed them on to the yard and see if that would stop how far um, the amount of time he would come to the food and how quickly he ate. So I would hit the clock as soon as I saw him um, with the distance and it was at 75, you know, I was at 50 yards and I moved down. So I hit the clock as soon as he came out the wood line and as soon as he got to the trough, I'd stop, hit the clock as soon as he started eating, see how fast he ate, I'd stop it. And then when he'd take off, I would hit the stop again to see how, um, and then see, no, I hit the clock, see how fast he ate, and then he left. And then we did that all the time. Um, some independent factors, if there was a wear of noise, I, I, you know, my, my factor was the, the length away from the, um, the tree line with the trough, but, if there was a loud noise per se and or another scent or you know a gunshot or anything like that these are all factors i couldn't do that many skewed my data now opposite of that is longitudinal that is providing information of, about individual change in a performance of a great time um for examples a lot of these shows you watch on discovery channel they have a pride alliance they follow from these cubs all the way up to adulthood until they have their own pride and that's great and everything, um, but you have to put in effect of everything that um, that lion male went through that cub. So just because your two cubs act this way over a long period of time and they do something this way doesn't mean everything will do this way. And we don't know if these cubs were weaker or smaller when they were growing up because we don't know if their parents got diseases. We don't know if the mom wasn't providing great nutrition for the milk. All these things have to be accounted for, and it kind of skews data when you're doing it that long. So like I said, the Prada lines is what I use because you have, if you focus on the Prada lines and you focus on the Cubs and signs, you watch them grow up and you follow where those Cubs went all the way through their life until they died, you're only focusing on those two lions. 
And we can't say that's how all wines do. Now, the studies she put were actually really great because she was saying that there is a way, you know, birds studying the population of bird migrant migratory patterns is you're studying a bigger population, but over a longer period of time. And that's, um, that's a pretty good way to do that. Um, so we now we're at how animals communicate. And this one was interesting to me. Um, you have cooperative and dishonest. So here's what we did for cooperative. And this is going to come back to in the future slide. Cooperative is talking about tobacco plants and the parasitic animals. All right, so you have a caterpillar, and he's hungry, and he gets on these tobacco plants, and he starts munching away. Well, the tobacco plant will then release a pheromone to tell a parasitic wasp nearby, hey, I'm getting eaten, and it's by a caterpillar. And now the parasitic wasp shows up, gets the caterpillar, is able to implant her, um, it paralyzes the, the caterpillar, so the plant stuff gets eaten, um, lays her eggs, and then when it's ready to hatch, kills the caterpillar. So it's cooperative, and that's supposed to be, and I, I apologize, I'll fix this, um, that's supposed to be a positive and a positive um, on there. They both benefit um, on that. This honestly can lean. I use a fiddler, fiddler crab claw. And if you've ever seen a fiddler crab, they have these big claws. And the first one, they grow is huge and they will fight other males, but they undoubtedly will always come off. Um, but they will grow new ones. The problem is the new one's not nearly as strong as the um, old one. It's lighter and they break off easy. But that's how you attract females. You have the bigger claw. Therefore, he's kind of just lying to the fiddler crab. And um, he's lying to the female. So one benefits the male. One is actually lied to the female. Um, incidental, we're going back to the caterpillars eating the plants. One, one benefits. Uh, one can be negative, but how that works is incidental is the caterpillar eating the tobacco plants. The caterpillar did not realize it released a pheromone for um, the, the uh, plant, the tobacco plant. And therefore, it did not benefit, but the plant itself benefited. Um, but like I said, it was incidental because the, the um, caterpillar had no idea that was happening. So spiteful. Um, I didn't really have one for this. I worked at a Santa Fe teaching zoo for a while, and I watched a, 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 um, a capuchin, uh, or capuchin, I don't know how to really say capuchin, he was in a, he was in a, um, he was in a, in a cage, and he was in one of the uh, um, nice cages out there, and a squirrel was near it, and then I watched him, like, um, the squirrel, like, nicked at him when he went to touch it, and then I watched that, that monkey stare at him the whole time, and I was doing some work, doing some thing, and then I watched the monkey go and get some food, literally grab some of his food and hold it for the squirrel, and then the squirrel took it, and it was a baby or a younger squirrel, and when the squirrel did it, he grabbed the squirrel and then, like, literally killed it. And so I guess I'd be spiteful. Um, he signaled that, hey, there's food here, like, it's, 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 it's okay, no threat here, and then he just ended up killing the squirrel. And I, it, uh, ever since then, I was like, mm, I didn't like that, um, because he was mad that the squirrel bit him in the first place. We're going to focus a good bit on this um, this uh, PowerPoint here. Um, this was a heck of a paper, polar bear foraging on common eater eggs, estimating the um, consequences, energetic consequences of climate mediated um, behavioral shifts. Uh, the title itself sounded long, but it was a great read. But in reality, it was a depressing read. Um, so, first of all, the, let's focus on two species, the polar bear um, and the common eater. Um, polar bear on your right side right here, um, common eater on your left side. And so, um, these are two. So, the common eater is a brown nesting species. Um, it goes to this island every, every year and they, nest, um, they burrow and they nest um, on the ground. Um, hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, thousands of them actually would go and nest. And the polar bears, you know, they're, they're typical, um, well-known carnivore up in the Arctic. 
they use ice, um, these like ice plates to move around for hunting and everything like that. That's how they get around. But now that the ice is melting, they are trying to find optimal foraging theory um, if this works for them. And we'll get into talking about that. So let's first talk about the location. Uh, Mitavik Island in not none none but Canada. I, I know I'm fine with something like that. But this island right here, which you've seen on the right side, this is where they go in the nest. And these these polar bears can come through here. And this will be all covered by nesting grounds. And this gives you a heads up on it and the ice caps. And so I just wanted to give you an idea on how everything is working around right there. So let's talk about the reasons. Well, I'm going to kind of get off topic here when we get to it. But the decline of the ice caps and polar bears to follow the ultimate origin theory. That means you are going to eat something that's energetic with the last of the, like, with the least. <sighs> Let me rephrase this. You will forage for whatever is least energetic cost to get, but most energetic cost um, positive to your body. So you will eat, most animals will eat what's easier to get to them versus what is actually easier and what is better for them. And let me explain it this way. Seals have coverage into this as well. I did a study, I read a study last year in um, conservation ecology, or one of them, global change ecology. Um, about the seals, and so what's happening is when we're dumping chum over, the seals are eating all the chum, and they're eating everything, and they're not going to fishing for real fish, and so they're eating, and they're getting full, but they're not getting fat, and the blubber and everything is, is shrinking because they're not getting enough what they need, so they're not being able to deal with the cold as well, so they're actually, the optimal foraging theory is a negative for them. Um, so I tell you that to, to kind of lead to where this is going. It's never really great when there's a lot of food, but low, low energetic um, ability with it. So the common eaters are ground nesters. And for instance, one polar bear ate 206 nests in a 96 hour period. That's a lot of eggs. So what they want to do is see if these eggs can give energetic benefits to the bears who first arrive. And after that, they lose resources, low energy. It's not worth going. It's not worth foraging, but they're using energy to get them to forage. So they predicted the bears would have energetic benefit in the beginning, but it would decline with a lack of resources. Typical. Um, really good. Um, I, you know, good theory. So Mitavik Island on June 10th and 20th is when it was done. Um, the drone had HD, they had drones, they had HD cameras. They filmed it between 0530 and 2030 and stopped when bears went to sleep or left. Um, they separated bears by markings. Um, if they could not determine the sex of the bears, which they couldn't, but if they could not find, they couldn't determine if that was the same bear or anything, they would just label it as a new bear. And that's how they would do that to fix the copy in. So the method, um, back to the methods continue. So they wanted to know the energetic gain. So they measured the number of clutches each bear consumed out of 20 bears. Um, they ran a statistical analysis, benefits, they did the benefits, cost of foraging on the eater eggs, and benefits and cost of resource density. Um, so they're in the, that was their analysis, but the independent variables were foraging, and the dependent variables were rate of clutch consumption, rate of energy per minute, and rate of gain, energy gain per minute. So how they would do that is they are independent, uh, dependent, independent variables, was just foraging, um, the bears are kind of foraging. But the dependent variables like changes, like how long did the bear start searching for these eggs? How long did he always look for them? Um, rate of energy used per minute and rate of energy gained. And so the results are 443 clutches were consumed by bears, um, which is a lot of eggs. And what was good about that, you know, the consumption rates decreased as the season progressed, which they hypothesized. Um, that 20 clutches in the beginning were eaten a day, um, and then with uh, a less than eight in the last three days. And so it showed the cost benefits, benefits only for a limited time, not maintaining source of food. And why is this mildly depressing? Well, for two reasons. We just saw a study where the polar bears are getting food thrown at them. Um, this is tons of eggs, high protein. The ice caps are melting. With the ice caps melting, they have to figure out how to forage optimally. They have to figure out what to do next. This isn't it. 
I mean, even if it wasn't, these birds will not have enough to resupply. So two species are actually getting affected by this global um, this global warming here. So you read it and you're like, ah, it's kind of sad. Number one, how many eggs they're eating and how many birds are probably just sitting there watching their, 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 their work get destroyed. But B, watching, there's no really other choice for these animals, these polar bears, like hunting in the way that they, they hunt and then get decimated the way they travel is get decimated. So it was a very sad read, but it was a very um, appropriate read for this study um, and it was a big hit. So while I hope I answered everything, um, did the proximate, the hows. So just for a summary, you know, we first answer the questions, we go, you know, developmental from um, uh, we just go back here so we just do the four questions the causations developmental function in um, phylogeny of it the history and that is kind of the basis of everything it goes from proximate to ultimate proximate is the how the ultimate is the why from there we talk about hormones hormones as in like uh, one is organizational one is um, activational and you know that organizational is what you're born with and the activational is what's triggered and causes it so like i said um the season and seasons and the time of mating cause the animals to grow faster in gear but they were always born with testosterone so that did that we talked about cross-sectional studies and longitudinal studies cross-sectional is great for short periods um even the um study we just read with the polar bears cross-sectional longitudinal is great for long times um, communication we talked about co cooperative um, dishonest spiteful and incidental um, that and that's pretty much a whole exam so it, i look forward to um answering questions you have so um, enjoy your day